John Stith Pemberton was a pharmacist born in 1831. It's most likely that you don't recognize his name, but it's certain that you're familiar with his most famous product, Coca-Cola. The Georgia native discovered this now ubiquitous soda after he sustained a sabre wound while fighting in the Civil War for the Confederate Army. Like hundreds of thousands of other American soldiers, both Union and Confederate, who survived the war with their lives intact but their bodies maimed by terrible wounds, Pemberton became addicted to one of the most widely prescribed painkillers of the time, morphine. After experimenting with a variety of different chemical compositions, Pemberton stumbled across what he believed to be a cure. Using extract from the Damiana plant and the cola nut, he combined a mix of ingredients to create a tonic that he christened Pemberton's French Coca Wine. As the name hints, the key ingredient was cocaine, and the main purpose of the drink was to cure morphine sickness. Though the cocaine has since been replaced with caffeine and it's no longer used to remedy opiate addiction, Coca-Cola has become one of the most popular drinks in human history. Pemberton never knew what a marvelous creation he discovered as he sold the patent to Coca-Cola on his deathbed for a mere 1750 bucks. The story of the Slinky begins with a mechanical engineer, a shipbuilding factory, and a mishap. It was 1943. The US Navy needed ships for World War II as the Battle of the Atlantic raged in the oceans around Europe. Mechanical engineer Richard James was trying to develop a new tension spring that could keep a ship's equipment secure while the vessel rocked at sea. One day, he accidentally knocked a spring off his work table. The spring tumbled to the floor, landing on one of its ends. But instead of jumping back up, the spring flopped end over end, walking across the floor. This gave him a unique idea. Perhaps this device was not destined to be used on a military ship. Instead, James envisioned a toy which kids could play with that essentially functioned as a perpetual motion machine. He and his wife borrowed $500 to manufacture the first Slinkies. Initial sales proved sluggish, but soared after Gimbel's department store in Philadelphia allowed demonstrations for Christmas in 1945. The first 400 Slinkies sold within minutes. An advertisement with a memorable jingle familiarized a national customer base. Now, at the end of the 20th century and 250 million Slinkies later, people continue to buy them. It's rare to find a park without a group of people playing with a frisbee. But did you know that frisbees were never meant to be used for recreation? It turns out that William Russell Frisbee left the Civil War in 1871 and bought a bakery in Bridgeport, Connecticut. The Frisbee Pie Company became an enormous success and eventually sold 80,000 pies per day. But there is a reason we don't associate the word frisbee with pies. The metal containers with frisbee pies stamped on the bottom turned out to have more than one use. Besides holding the pies inside, the flat metal pan was showing some aerodynamic properties too. This was first noticed by the workers at the bakery and then by local children who started throwing the dishes around during their breaks. Frisbee pies were supplied in many restaurants and groceries around Northeast US. One of their major consumers was Yale University. Soon enough, students from the campus found out about the properties of the dish, and thus the modern frisbee was born. Obviously, manufacturers have since found much more aerodynamic materials, but these flying discs still bear the name of their inadvertent creator, William Russell Frisbee. Bubble wrap is a fun part of receiving a gift. Kids love to pop the bubbles, and they are super effective at protecting packages. But the truth is that the bubble wrap was not intended for use in packing at all. In fact, the inventors were trying to create a textured wallpaper in 1957 that would appeal to the burgeoning beat generation. They put two pieces of plastic shower curtain through a heat sealing machine, but were disappointed at first by the results. A sheet of film with trapped air bubbles. But the entrepreneurs soon discovered they were onto something. On October 5, 1959, IBM had announced their new 1401 variable word length computer. One of the bubble wrap inventors got the idea that bubble wrap could be used as a good packaging material to protect the computer while it was being shipped. He pitched the idea to IBM and demonstrated bubble wrap's protective abilities. His demonstration went over well, and IBM began purchasing bubble wrap to protect their 1401 and other fragile products they sold and shipped. Since then, it has become the quintessential wrapping material all over the world. 
Listerine, now a product of Pfizer Incorporated, is a common household item known for its antiseptic properties. While used today primarily as a mouthwash for oral health and hygiene, it's been sold as a surgical disinfectant, a cure for dandruff, a floor cleaner, a hair tonic, deodorant, and as a beneficial remedy for diseases, ranging from diphtheria and dysentery to smallpox and gonorrhea. Inspired by Louis Pasteur's ideas on microbial infection, the English doctor Joseph Lister demonstrated in 1865 that use of carbolic acid on surgical dressings would significantly reduce rates of post-surgical infection. Lister's work in turn inspired St. Louis-based Dr. Joseph Lawrence to develop an alcohol-based formula for a surgical antiseptic, which included eucalyptol, menthol, methyl salicylate, and thymol. Lawrence named his antiseptic Listerine in honor of Lister. So, this minty mouthwash was actually intended to be a medical-grade antiseptic used for surgeries. This never took off, so the company went through a wide variety of trials, including a short-lived Listerine cigarette. Finally, they settled on the powerful minty substance, which is recognizable around the world today. Now, Listerine makes millions of dollars for Pfizer every year, proving that it's an essential staple of any medicine cabinet. Kleenex is a brand that has effectively become synonymous with its own product, the common facial tissue. In 1924, the Kleenex brand of facial tissue was first introduced. Kleenex tissue was invented as a means to remove cold cream, a type of emulsion meant to smooth the skin and remove makeup. Early advertisements linked Kleenex to Hollywood makeup departments and sometimes included endorsements from movie stars Helen Hayes and Jean Harlow, who used Kleenex to remove their theatrical makeup with cold cream. A few years after the introduction of Kleenex, the company's head researcher tried to persuade the head of advertising to try to market the tissue for colds and hay fever. The administrator declined the idea, but then committed a small amount of ad space to the mention of using Kleenex tissue as a handkerchief. By the 1930s, Kleenex was being marketed with the slogan, don't carry a cold in your pocket, and its use as a disposable handkerchief replacement became predominant. Now it has many purposes, but it's the go-to tool when you have the sniffles. It turns out this is all due to a subtle change in advertising. Propecia is one of the two leading forms of medical hair regrowth. It's known for having some adverse side effects like a lack of libido and breast cancer, but it turns out this drug was never intended to help restore hair. In 1942, James Hamilton, a doctor in New York State, observed a series of sexually ambiguous children in the Caribbean. As babies, they had no physiological signs of either male or female, but around the age of 12, they all grew male genitalia. Perplexed, Hamilton studied them and realized they possessed a certain compound that had a wild effect on their hormones. Hamilton was able to isolate this compound and initially put it on the market as a cure for enlarged prostates and later for prostate cancer. These were partially successful, but soon doctors noticed that their male patients were regrowing hair at a fast pace. Thus, it was rebranded as a hair regrowth pill and became the popular medicine it is today. The story of Play-Doh began with Kutol, a Cincinnati-based soap company that was about to go broke in the late 1920s. The 21-year-old owner began frantically selling off their products for deep bargains in a last-ditch effort to break even. It worked. Kutol began to turn a profit and had their products placed in stores around the country. That's when the massive Kroger grocery chain approached Kutol in 1933 and asked if they produced a wallpaper cleaner. Wallpaper cleaner was a hot commodity, as at the time, coal was the leading way to heat one's home, being much more efficient and cheaper than wood. This had the negative side effect of leaving a layer of soot everywhere that was difficult to clean off of wallpaper as you couldn't get it wet. The owner took a risk and claimed that his company could produce the cleaner. They succeeded in creating Play-Doh, which prompted Kroger to buy 15,000 units right away. It was an instant success, but in the 1950s, families moved away from coal-burning stoves and sales plummeted. However, the folks at Kutol were crafty enough to realize that you can repackage the exact same product and sell it back to the public. Thus, Play-Doh was born. It was the exact same substance, only marketed to kids. It is today. 7-Up, the 85-year-old citrus soft drink, once went by the less catchy name Bib Label Lithiated Lemon Lime Soda, and it was packed with mood-enhancing lithium. Lithium, a salt found in groundwater, has long been used to treat bipolar disorder and depression. 
An essay by psychiatrist and Cornell University professor Anna Fels, published in the New York Times, argued for adding low doses of the substance, mostly used to produce ceramics, glass and batteries, to drinking water in hopes of lowering rates of suicide, murder and rape. That means that this common soda was initially used as a mood stabilizer. It was only until 1950 that they dropped the lithium citrate after research showed it had the potential for dangerous side effects, about 31 years after the soda launched. While it's still pretty unclear where the 7-Up name came from, founder Charles Grigg once joked that it was intended to cure the seven types of hangovers humans experience.